Welcome to Psychology Neuroscience 3190 Psycholinguistics for Fall 2020. This course is for third or fourth year students who are interested in language and communication, how we process language and what languages look like around the world. The course is taught by me, Myrtle Brandiger. I'm a speech and language pathologist with research background in bilingual language development. I've worked clinically for many years with children with speech and language disorders. In this class, we ask questions such as, what is language really? Uh, what do we need language for? What happens in our brains when we communicate? We ask if language is uniquely human and how animals communicate and what the differences might be. We look at the different components of language and see how we process these aspects. So we look at speech and speech sounds, we look at vocabulary, we look at grammar, and we look at the social side of language, how we use language in social interactions and nonverbal aspects of language. A big debate in language research is the question of whether language is a taught through interaction with other humans or whether language is an innate ability that we're born with. Now, this is a take on the old nature versus nurture debate. Now, for example, if a child is raised without any social interactions, will they still develop language? The course also looks at neuroanatomy and the neuroscience behind language processing. What brain areas are responsible for language functions and how do we process the different aspects of language? We ask how kids learn language, what strategies they use, and when they learn language. For example, we look at word learning. How do we learn words? Now, if I were to ask you to point to the blicket, you would probably point to the object on the far left. But how would you actually know that that's a blicket when you've probably never heard it before or seen the object? What strategy is going on here? We also look at how words are organized in our mental lexicon and how they relate to each other. What happens when a word gets activated? Another aspect we look at is reading and writing. How do we read? What impact does the ability to read have on our daily life? And what happens when reading is a struggle? We also do a little deep dive into grammar. What is grammar? Why is it important? So for example, we look at the underlying structure of sentences and how we process them. A good example is how we process ambiguous sentences. So if you look at the sentence, Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. How do we know who's holding the binoculars? Is it Sherlock or is it the other man? And what clues do we use in processing this to figure it out? Part of the course also deals with what happens when language doesn't work. We're going to talk about acquired language disorders, for example, after a stroke or traumatic brain injury. We're going to talk about developmental language disorders, which are present from the onset of language, as well as the language profiles of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. We talk some about bilingualism and how bilingual language development differs from monolingual development. Are there advantages or disadvantages with being bilingual? Does the brain function differently when you're bilingual? A really fun part is the one about language diversity. We talk about how languages are different and why it matters. We also talk a little bit about language extinction. So there are around 7,000 languages in the world, but one language dies every 14 days. So we talk about why is that important, why it doesn't matter, and what can we do about it. We look into whether people with different native languages process language differently. For example, in Russian and Greek, there are two separate words for dark blue and light blue, whereas in English, we only say blue. Would that mean that Greek speakers are faster at recognizing shades of blue than English speakers? So does their language facilitate their thinking? Likewise, languages outline body parts differently. So if a language only has one word for a limb, not dividing into leg and arm, or if they have no separate word for hand or, and fingers, does that mean they also perceive their body parts differently? Or is the difference just in the labeling of the words? We also talk a little about artificial languages, such, such as Esperanto or the fictional languages of Game of Thrones or Star Trek. Are these languages considered real languages? Why or why not? How are they different? Is it useful to learn an artificial language? Because some people do. Um, for example, did you know that you can learn High Valyrian on Duolingo? And then we put all of these pieces together to see how language works in our everyday communication. So the course is made up of 12 modules that will be released weekly. It's based on self-paced learning. So the whole module is released at once and you have the week to complete the material. Each module will consist of mini lectures, TED Talks and videos. 
We'll do some activities and experiments, small group discussions, and it will all take place on the Brightspace site. There will be readings and resources. The main textbook is a great one. It's available as hard copy or digital with the option to rent. Uh, you could get by with an earlier version too, but some chapters are different and we can talk about that. The grading will be based on two open book exams, a few assignments and participation in the online activities and discussions. The format is completely synchronous, so you can take the course from wherever you are in the world. Um, the only live elements will be optional office hours that are uh, taking place once weekly. If you have any questions about the course, I'll be happy to talk to you. Just send me an email and enjoy the rest of your summer.